All right. Oh, nice. All right. Good luck, folks. Okay. So shall we begin? Yeah, let's. Okay. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk on Fedora on Raspberry Pi development. So my name is uh, Joel Savitz. I am a kernel engineer at, uh, at Red Hat. I went to UMass Lowell, graduated last December with a computer science and math major, adult major. Hi, uh, my name is Thomas Guma, also a senior at UMass Lowell. I'm currently doing a co-op and I also worked on this project last semester in the spring. Hi, I'm uh, Charlie. I'm uh, a senior at UML, uh, studying computer science. Uh, I had an internship at Red Hat this summer, and I've been extended uh, to continue doing work on this project. Uh, excited to, to get into it. Joel is going to talk about, um, uh, well, the origins of the project. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, thanks. So uh, in the beginning, uh, we began this project um, back in, uh, in fall 2019. Um, Basically, I, I was a co-op at Red Hat, and you know I was doing various things. Uh, I ran into the um, Metro Boston Research Interest Group, and uh, through them, I found um, that there was this manager in uh, the Ceph Storage Group, Jeff Brown, and he had been running in a, an IoT class at UMass Lowell, where he had he'd been having people do various things with Raspberry Pis. You know, turn on turn on lights. You know, button stuff, motors. You know, various little IoT things. Uh, and Raspberry Pis, by default, use use Raspberry or use use a different OS than uh, than Fedora. Uh, and Jeff Brown was interested in using Fedora on his Raspberry Pis. Uh, Fedora's a pretty good OS. It's got it's got open source software. It's linked into the whole Red Hat network. You know, he works at Red Hat, so. He tried it out and uh, it didn't work very well. It was pretty janky. And so he wanted to improve it. And so we wanted to get some students to, to work on improving Fedora and you know making tweaks so he could use it in his class. So we put together a group of students and uh, sent Peter Robinson an email. Peter Robinson is the maintainer for the ARM architecture uh, on Fedora. And we got a a couple of different responses. So we formed a, a group of students at UMass Lowell who were working on this for uh, for mostly for course credit. Uh, and anyway, so we, we emailed this guy, Peter Robinson, and he gave us some suggestions on what to do. So first thing is, if RPI GPIO is so good, why didn't they make an RPI GPIO too? And um, well, that's exactly what we did. I mean, what, well, RPI GPIO2 is, um, is a re-implementation of, um, of a popular Python library for, uh, for Raspberry Pi, for interacting with the GPIO pins. Uh, basically, the way that it worked previously no longer works on Fedora. Uh, it uses kernel interfaces that are, that are no longer supported. Um, oh, this link is actually, this is out of date. But anyways, it's, uh, it just re-implements the API and uh, so that was the first thing we did um, over a couple of semesters. And um, yeah, so that was the first, the first part of this. The second thing that, uh, that Peter Robinson asked us was, uh, you know, where are the upstream drivers for the sense hat? So, well, what is the sense hat? The sense hat is this uh, attachment for the Raspberry Pi 4 that uh, it's hat stands for hardware attached on top. It's their like kind of clever name where they're like, oh, you know, it's you put it on like a hat and then it's also an acronym, you know, people, people in tech do that all the time. Uh, and that basically has this LED grid, a little joystick, as you can see that, you know, you can use for controlling things. It's got an accelerometer, temperature stuff, you know, various, various sensors uh, that work over, over I squared C. So here's the, here's the, equipment that our that our group has got this uh this past semester um yeah over the course of of working on this um you know people people have uh come in and out of the project uh, its most current iteration is uh 
mostly a group of students who joined uh, at the beginning of this year and worked on it as a uh, as a directed study for credit and then worked on it um, most of them joined Red Hat as interns to continue working it over the summer uh, and this is this is just the kind of batch of equipment we used to set up um, UEFI booting of Fedora and there's a just an example of the, of the pie itself so in general, what we're doing here, what this project is about, is just trying to extend Fedora usability, stability, and performance on the Raspberry Pi, specifically the Raspberry Pi 4, 4B, is that's the latest one. Uh, and so it's partly just a development project, you know, a bunch of engineers learning, you know, about, about the Raspberry Pi, improving the Raspberry Pi, uh, and, and Fedora support for the Raspberry Pi. But it's also about uh, introducing students to Linux kernel development and low-level development, which is a notoriously uh, esoteric and um, somewhat difficult area to break into of of the uh, software engineering space. Uh, it's just seen as kind of the you know weird kind of magic thing that makes the machine work, and 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 most people don't worry about it, and it, it can be kind of an intimidating place to get into. So a big part of what we're trying to do is is continue to get students involved um, and. You know, teach them about this space, and so we want to. We're we're continuing to do that uh, this semester as well, and we're going to bring some new students in into the project. So, and of course, we would like to make Fedora a default choice on the Raspberry Pi. Obviously, not the default choice because you know Raspbian is is kind of the official OS, but we want to make something Fedora move Fedora closer towards being an operating system for the Raspberry Pi that people turn to, um, you know, one of the first couple that people turn to, maybe maybe even their preferred OS. So quick aside, how do I get started with Fedora? If you might be interested, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great OS. It's in the Red Hat ecosystem. You know, it's, it's sponsored by Red Hat and it's, uh, you know, but it's independent, it's their own thing. It's, uh, you know, completely free and open source software, at least in the official repositories. And I'd recommend dual booting it on your PC if you wanna, if you wanna check it out. So uh, now I'll, I'll hand it off to Thomas to discuss the independent slash directed study in more detail, which uh, I guess I'll just mention, you know, for those that aren't, that aren't familiar, that's just a, a class, you know, an academic class that, uh, that is kind of self, self-directed. So you get course credit. So, Thomas, uh, off to you. Do you want to do you want to switch to sharing yourself? Uh, yeah, I can do it. Okay. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yep. No, I can see. It, yeah. Okay. Um, so the main project, I guess the main thing that we did during the directed study last spring semester was to read this book, the Linux device drivers book, the third edition, to gain some knowledge about device driver development. Um, some things to know before I go forward are the kernel module and the device driver. A kernel module is a piece of code that extends the kernel's functionality and can be added and removed from the kernel upon demand. And the device driver is a file that enables one or more hardware devices to communicate with the operating system. And this can be implemented as a kernel module. Um, here's an example of a very simple kernel module. It only has two functions, the hello init and hello exit functions that print out messages to the system log. The last two lines at the bottom of this program are macros in the kernel, the module init macro and module exit macro that define the hello init function and the hello exit function and make sure they're executed at module insertion time and module remover time, uh, depending on uh, whether the module was removed or inserted. Um, the following commands are used to insert a module in the running kernel and remove the module and display a system log, uh, respectively. In SMOD, inserts a module in the kernel. RMMOD removes a, the module from the kernel and dmessage displays a system log. And um, you can see the following messages, hello world and goodbye, cruel world. 
when you run the message. Um, the main goal of reading the book was to understand the character driver development. A character driver is a driver that communicates with hardware by sending and receiving single characters. And it has four main operations, which include open, read, write, and release. The open function initializes and allocates memory that might be used for later operations like read and write. Read simply reads data from the hardware peripheral and sends it to user space, and write does the opposite. It sends data from the user space to the hardware. The release function deallocates memory that might have been allocated in open and uh, basically shuts down the driver. These are the four main operations. Some of the top important things that we covered include debugging, memory allocation, and communicating with hardware. Um, debugging. I'll be going over printing and watching. Debugging by printing is where a driver is written to send messages or write messages to the system log when certain operations fail. For example, memory allocation. If memory allocation fails, then you can write a message to the system log saying, something like the memory memory allocation failed or something like that. And the developer would know where to go when they, they ran the message um, to check out the system log. Debugging by watching uh, can be done by basically testing the driver for certain operations like read. You can call read in user space and study its results. If they're appropriate, then you know it's working. If they're not, then you know something is going wrong. Um, moving on to memory allocation. Kmalloc is a very common function used in the, in the kernel for memory allocation, which is the equivalent of uh, user space malloc, I think. Um, Kmalloc, they work differently. Um, Kmalloc does certain things differently. For example, it only allocates contiguous physical memory while malloc allocates virtual memory that's fragmented. Um, another difference between the two is um, the fact that Kmalloc can be used to allocate memory for certain specific operations like DMA operations or um, just regular kernel RAM, but malloc is used to allocate a memory that's just, you know, like bite-sized memory specified by a user. Um, communication with hardware is done over I squared C for our sense side peripheral. Um, I squared C is a serial communications protocol that where data is sent bit by bit uh, along a wire that's connected to the processor. Uh, these are some of the important things that were covered in the book. Um, I thought the book was a good introduction to Linux um, and driver development, especially for a student like me who was, uh, who was looking to gain some experience on a project outside of class. I think this book uh, was real interesting. Um, some practical exercises we did included kernel compilation. This actually took me a few attempts to successfully do it. We also studied the Sansa drivers and uh, made annotations um, to understand how the driver works. Uh, we tested the drivers and a few examples from the Linux device drivers book. And uh, overall, I thought this this was a good um, this was a good learning experience, and uh, I'm glad that I joined this project. Um, I'll I'll pass it on to. Uh, Charlie now. I just realized my microphone is muted. Apologies about that. All right, so can I can everyone see? Uh, my screen. Yeah, we can. Cool, perfect. Alrighty. So yeah, uh, I'm going to be speaking mostly about what we did during our summer internship. So both me and Thomas uh, 
we're working at Red Hat this summer, uh, you know, at an internship. Um, we're both continuing to work on this project now uh, during the semester. Um, and yeah, this summer internship was uh, was an opportunity to really dive in and focus, uh, you know, almost exclusively on this project for a summer, um, which was an exciting opportunity. And the main thing that we were working on um, was the driver for the sense app. We wanted to try and get that accepted into upstream Linux. Um, so, you know, to do that, we had to learn, obviously, how to interact with the Linux kernel uh, community. So we had to learn how to create patches, um, uh, patch sets in Git, uh, and learn how to use Git sent email to, to share them with other people. Um, and, you know, that obviously involved posting on the Linux kernel mailing list, which could definitely be a little bit intimidating. But I think that, um, you know, my experience was that it was, it was really not a big deal. Uh, I mean, obviously, um, it was... Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, there's a lot of helpful people there that are trying to help you make your code better. So for the most part, I, I had a good experience with that. Uh, and, you know, obviously, yeah, we're receiving feedback uh, based on how things were, um, you know, uh, really we were looking for feedback uh, on how the code was. So we started in the very beginning with the code directly from uh, the Raspberry Pi source tree. Um, so we did an initial re request for comment. Um, where Joel literally just took uh, the code basically exactly as it was from the Raspberry Pi tree and just made sure that he could get it compiling um, on the kernel. And so um, we got some feedback. We posted this RFC and we got some feedback. Uh, essentially, there were there were some pretty substantial issues just because, you know, we really hadn't done much work on it. Um, <laughs> the... Um, the you know there were a couple things that were platform specific um you know some fallbacks and some um error handling uh situations were specific to the raspberry pi and so we had to remove those for um for upstreaming the driver um but the biggest issue was that the uh driver for the display um for the 8x8 uh matrix of leds was written as a frame buffer uh device and uh, that subsystem is being deprecated at the moment. And so we weren't going to be able to add a new frame buffer device. We weren't going to be able to get our driver accepted upstream uh, if it was a frame buffer device. So really, um, that set at our big goal, which was like, OK, so we have a little bit of you know fixing up to do. But the big thing was like, OK, can we get rid of this frame buffer device so that we can um, so that we can get this, you know, like that that needs to go. Um, so we worked on those issues, and then we created a second RFC um, that was about a month ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, and having um, having uh, having obviously made the code a little bit closer, we were able to receive more detailed uh, feedback. Uh, you know, <laughs> if the feedback you get from one of the one of the modules is just like, "Well, this is a frame buffer driver; the whole thing has to go," uh, you're not going to get a lot of uh, detail. So um, having made it a little bit closer. You were able to, we were able to receive more more uh, specific guidance. Um, so you know things like uh, using we should have used the string you know Raspberry Pi instead of RPI uh, because Raspberry Pi is more common upstream, whereas RPI is more common maybe within the um, the Raspberry Pi specific stuff. You know or things like saying if not pointer instead of comparing a pointer to null or or little things like that where um, you know just you know find details. Um, we also decided to do a big overhaul of the code base stylistically because the code, as it as it came to us, uh, referred to you know all of the file names and all the functions and everything was referred to as RPI sense, um, RPI sense this, RPI sense that, and we decided to switch it to sense hat uh, just because we thought it uh, thought it was nicer. Um, so having done that, we submitted a third e uh, RFC and that was published uh, two weeks ago uh, today. Um, and you know we're still collecting um, comments. Uh, feel free to check it out. There's going to be a link on the last slide. Um, yeah, so we're we're hoping to get more feedback about uh, this driver. We're we're getting pretty close to to having it submitted. Well, at least I hope so. You know, knock on wood. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I guess the the real question is. Um, what are our future plans? So obviously we want to um, we want to get this driver upstreamed, um, and then we're hoping to get more students involved. So um, we're planning a, a small directed study class again at UML this fall, 
and we're trying to pull in, you know, some more students, maybe junior or senior level students who have taken a class in operating systems but want to go deeper. Um, and we're hoping to work with these students and we're going to continue working on the sense that driver and hopefully get it upstreamed. Um, and when that clears up or maybe in parallel, we may look into other uh, features from Raspberry Pi OS or other drivers to try and, uh, yeah, to try and get it um, really, really polish the details and make, make uh, Fedora really a first class option on Raspberry Pi. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A now, um, and feel free to email any of us with, with more questions. We have our emails there, uh, and also our Google group, which you could uh, email or join. Um, we have a link to our GitHub, um, where you can see all of the, um, you know, all of the repositories where we, where we develop our code, and there's also a link to our most recent RFC, and a link to our website. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions? So, um, yes, our group is uh, open to, to anyone. I mean, we have a lot of people who come from Red Hat. Um, we have people uh, who are students who are just interested. I know we had someone actually who was a, um, who was a high school student, um, and uh, they were interested in our project, and they helped us with, um, uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, Joel, the idea. Uh, I guess when you get your mic working, um, maybe you can try. Uh, uh, you can just interrupt me. <laughs> yeah. So we have we have lots of people who get involved in uh, this this project. Uh, it's open to anyone. Uh, we have a lot of people from Red Hat, um, and we're actually looking. You know, even in the vein of universities. Uh, yeah. So in, in the vein of users, we're also looking into um, some other universities. Uh, Bobby Asha, who works on this, you know, he's been involved in this project, is looking into potentially um, doing a similar thing to direct study at a university that he has connections with. Um, so Heidi also asked, how do you advertise for students aside from DevCon? Um, uh, I don't know. Actually, Thomas, if you want, you're welcome to answer some. I mean, I, I, I realize that I've been talking for a while. I don't know if anyone else uh, wants to take a shot at answering some of the questions. Um, I don't know. We basically we, we've been uh we mostly focus on uml students because we already know a professor that's willing to uh oversee the director study but um my mentor bobby Acha has also been uh going to another university somewhere trying to get students but this semester i think it was too late or something like that um mm -hmm. so try to get more students from other schools um no Hello? Yes, Hello? hopefully. Oh, there's oh, Joel. Nice. Okay. I'm going to probably stop sharing, actually, maybe so that, um, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> oh, so, oh, yeah. So I have a, uh, a demo, short demo. So here is the, uh, the device itself. So I'll plug them and everything at the hat. So uh, here's the, the LED thing. So uh, I'm going to run a program at Charlie. Right? So when I rebooted my computer earlier, I was trying to reboot the Raspberry Pi. That's what happened. So there's this program where uh, that Charlie wrote called Frame Buffer Test. It's in a repo that just allows you to control the um, one square arrow keys here and just puts a random color in. So that's just something you can use as a basic test. You know, the joystick over here, I mean, you, this doesn't do anything interesting because it's. I'm doing it over SSH. If I was doing this over running this on the on the TGY, I think this would actually control the, um, you know, the LED, but it doesn't. So that's one thing. And then there's one other. There's one other program that's uh, kind of interesting. That's called uh, Color Test. All right, I'll just show a bunch of colors to test that they work. So, that. and then the other the, the other feature is the, um, oh, I guess Charlie, Charlie disappeared. Uh, the other feature is uh, in 
like the accelerometer temperature sensor various things those are all um those all have other drivers so those are those are already in there yeah joel um id was also asking how do how we report what um id was asking how do we report project how do we yeah. recruit yeah uh Dead. well anyone who's interested can can start contributing i mean we have a number of people at red hat uh red hat employees who are who are involved and then i mean you don't have to work for red hat to be involved i mean all this stuff is all open source um i mean any students can get in contact with us like if i mean any student in any university they could if they can arrange something with their with a professor they could potentially arrange something for for credit um you know on a, on a kind of individual basis you know my apologies no, uh, no, i no, cut no. out there for a second <laughs> yeah we're all uh, we're all doing, we're doing great with our uh <laughs> our, tight, our setup here <laughs> uh, i think well, there was another question about how um how well fedora works with the raspberry pi mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. think that we in the chat there somewhere uh i'm i think i'm looking at a completely different chat right now Okay, fair enough. I can scroll up and find it. Um, yeah, so um, I believe, Joel, you, you know, like the question is, where is where the gaps, you know, basic uh, OS compatibility uh, with Raspberry Pi, or is it mainly getting peripherals to work like the hats and the camera and everything? And I think, Joel, you had some experience uh, where like even things like a keyboard didn't work or something. I mean, I don't know, do you want to speak to that in the yeah, very beginning? Yeah, so there, there were some issues getting the keyboard to work, or the, the my, I don't know, it could have been my keyboard as well. Uh, but at times it would boot. When I was booting without the UEFI, um, I think when I was booting like Fedora 32, the keyboard mm -hmm. didn't work. Uh, and the, you know, there was a time when you had to, um, I don't know, like a year ago, when if you loaded Fedora, you either had to use Rawhide Fedora or you had to, at least one of the ways, the way I think Robert Grimm did it was like he just took the, uh, in, in this blog post we found, which is widely known. Uh, he just took the RPMs for a newer kernel and put them inside of the, the Fedora image and then booted a Fedora image that didn't have Ethernet support, upgraded the kernel from the RPMs he had pre-installed or pre-downloaded, and then that enabled Ethernet. But now later versions just you know pretty much work out of the box. At least, I mean, I've only been using it uh, with a CLI, so... Mm -hmm. This is pretty smooth. Yeah. Uh, a lot better. The Raspberry Pi 3 was pretty difficult to use just because of how slow it was to do basic things like, uh, you know, run any DNF command. It would take <laughs> a few minutes. But, yeah, I mean, there are also some gaps in, you know, in, in kernel support for various things that are listed. There's a couple of different GitHub pages that are listed. Uh, one of them is just a random GitHub issue on like an unrelated repo uh, that has just like upstream stuff. So that's that's there. And then we've also been looking into some different things. You know, we, we identified a couple of areas in, like uh, where there's there's some gaps. You know, different utilities like the Raspi config thing isn't available. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's difficult to you can't virtualize the Raspberry Pi four. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of a general thing. Or like Kimu doesn't have support for the Raspberry Pi four. Um, well, there's a there's a question about using another hat. Uh, we haven't used it for this project, but I don't know, Joel, have you tried a different one? Uh, any other hats with Fedora? Well, I know I haven't personally tried, but um, but there are. Um, there, there, as listed on that that link that I posted, there are a bunch of people who are who have. Or there's a bunch of people working on different support for hats, I believe, and I know there's one for. Um, actually, there might be no, there might be hardly anyone working on it, but the the power over Ethernet hat has, I believe, has a driver in upstream Linux that was worked on by uh, Nicholas Sands Julian or something. I think he was upstreaming that. And that would be listed at that link. You know, I think I just realized I posted that link in the, just the main event chat. <laughs> that, uh, that would explain why it didn't show up. That, that's, that's that link that I'm uh, referring yeah. to. I don't know if I can delete it from the other one. 
but that's too late, whatever. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Oh, sounds good. Uh, I would recommend you guys uh, post all your links, uh, slides and everything uh, in your shared profile. Uh, so mm -hmm. if people search for you, they should be able to find all the slides, right? Thank you so much. That was a great uh, presentation. And then? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. So.